guys, it's Sam and this is my June wrap-up. So before we get into the wrap-up, today, the day I'm uploading this, which is July 4th of 2020, is my six-year booktube anniversary. I know, I don't know what made me upload on July 4th of all days because I am not a patriotic person, but I've been here for six years. Thank you for those of you that have been with me and all the support you give me over the years. It is just a little mind-blowing that I've been on this platform for six years. But I'm continually grateful for YouTube. As I've said before, throughout the time I've been on YouTube, YouTube has been such a source of comfort in a lot of ways for me and social connection. And that is especially true right now when we still can't see people and, you know, the world is falling apart and everything. I really appreciate you guys still being here and still being willing to talk about books with me because that is why I got on YouTube in the first place. So let's get into the books that I read in June. June, I read 10 books. The first book was The Simple Wild by K.A. Tucker. This is a adult contemporary romance and it follows a woman whose life is kind of falling apart a little bit. She like lost her job, her boyfriend turned out to be an ass, and like everything is kind of going haywire and she ends up getting a call from her dad who she's been estranged from since she was a early teenager. I think she's about 12 and he is actually sick with cancer. So she ends up getting a call from a friend of his, not even him, saying that she should come and visit and maybe like possibly make amends. And he lives up in the bush of Alaska. So she travels from, I believe she lives in Toronto, where she's a city girl, to Alaska and is trying to like rekindle her relationship with her father and in the process she meets a pilot because her dad does run a plane company, a bush pilot, and they have like banter and stuff and everything kind of goes from there. So this is a very revered book in the adult romance genre and I went in with very high expectations and this ended up being a letdown for me. So for a number of reasons. One, this is a hate to love romance but people think that when you love hate to love romance you love all of them and I really don't like a lot of contemporary actually hate to love romances because it's very hard to not make the love interest, especially if it's a heterosexual romance, it's hard to make the main guy not an asshole. And in this case he was. And he was an asshole for about 60% of the book and it was very targeted assholery at her and very judgmental, very mean. He would make fun of things that were like blatantly not her fault like she needs soy milk in her, as her milk and he's like ah uh, snooty and it's like I'm allergic and I like stuff like that and he judged her before even coming and then there's this whole theme throughout of her dad just kind of being like a nice guy that doesn't know how to talk about his feelings and like she has to you know make allowances for that you know and he's dying and blah 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 and it's like she was the child. She was 12 and he wasn't the adult and like everyone around her does this. Also there's like this whole thing about she wears a lot of makeup and as time goes on she stops wearing as much makeup and he's like oh you're so beautiful without makeup and everyone around her is like you look so much better without this makeup and you caked on all your makeup and I'm like can you please stop acting like she's up in the bush caking on makeup for all of you because she's not but you're all acting like it. It was just a mess in a lot of ways for me so by the time we got to some of the more like good romantic bits like I was already against him and them for being an ass and like she doesn't have a lot of agency. There's there's like so many things I could say about this but I kind of don't want to do a full review about it. I did do a good read review that's in depth if you want to hear all my thoughts on that. Yeah, end up giving this 2.75 out of 5 stars, like a little bit more than half for me because like I still enjoyed parts of it, like I liked being up in the bush, like I still like wanted to read it but it fell flat for me. I was expecting it to be like a five star. The next book I read was Daisy Jones and the Six by Taylor Jenkins Reid. I have done a full review for this so I'll link that on the screen for my in-depth thoughts. This is a historical fiction that follows a fictional rock band from the 70s and they are getting interviewed in present day about their time, their like rise to fame and everything, and they're all being interviewed, parts of the band, as well as people that were connected to them, and this is their whole story. So because this is taking place around the 70s and like rock and roll culture, there are trigger warnings for drug and alcohol abuse, and emotionally and physically abusive relationship, off-page cheating, and an abortion scene that's also off-page but like talked about. So this is a book I listened to on audio and I highly recommend doing that because it is a fully casted audiobook and I really liked hearing all the different voices and everybody that was involved and it just made me feel much more connected to the story. This is an interesting book because it is sort of about all of the interactions of all these bandmates and all these really big rock and roll personalities but the main focus is really on Billy and Daisy who are the two lead singers in this band and their tumultuous relationship that's not really a love story because Billy is married uh, towards the beginning of the book and Daisy is not but they had this connection as like lead singers so it's this angsty like romance is kind of centered and affecting everybody and everyone's kind of toxic to each other and I never actually pulled for Billy and Daisy. So you have this thing where I did feel the angsty pain for them but I wasn't actually pulling for them because 
they they were being toxic. I actually really preferred a lot of the other side characters and there was even a romance between some of these side characters that I preferred more than this main romance that you're supposed to be kind of pulled into. So I still really enjoyed it though. For somebody who doesn't really like music culture books or books about like rock and roll, like I'm not like a sex, drugs, and rock and roll person. So the fact that it was really about that, I wasn't sure if I would like it a lot, but I ended up really enjoying it still, even though it was a book that I wasn't necessarily pulling for the main characters through at all times. So I end up giving this four out of five stars. I then read The Fate of the Tearling by Erica Johansson. This is the third and final book in the Tearling trilogy. I've done a full review for this as well and talking about the whole series. So I will link that on the screen. But this is the final book in an adult's fantasy trilogy and this was such a good wrap up for me. I talk about it more in depth in my review because I can't go into much of the details about this, but the ending of everything felt very complete and true to the story, but not necessarily satisfying. So this is a very polarizing final book for a lot of people, and so I knew that going into it. I really enjoyed this finale. I really felt like it was the finale that was sort of promised from the rest of the books in the series. This is a fantasy series, but there's a twist on that. It's not quite fantasy in the same way that you'd think of it. So all those elements really make this final book about tying up a lot of the loose ends, tying up a lot of how the past affected the present day, and the meaning of power and how you use your power and, and what that means and if you are your past or if you can break away from your past and a lot of these kinds of like higher kind of themes. So I really enjoyed that but the very end is very rushed so I didn't really love that as much and it is an unsatisfying ending although it feels correct. So I end up giving this four out of five stars. I then read Shorefall by Robert Jackson Bennett. This is the second book in the Founder series, the first book being Foundry Side, and this is an adult fantasy trilogy that features almost like a Venetian sort of setting and the main magic in here is more of inscribing runes and things onto objects to make them do things. So it's almost like technology in a fantastical setting. There are some trigger warnings in here for an off-page suicide, some suicidal ideation, and some body horror. So I really enjoyed the second installment. Foundry Side was one of my favorite books of the year that I read it, and this I also really enjoyed, but this felt much more about like the science of the magic system and all the like inscribing and everything like that, and much more thematic than action-based. The first book was a bit of a split between the action and the like philosophy and science and stuff and this was much more like explanation of some of that stuff and also fleshing out a lot of the world and, and sort of like the religion of like the science and where that came from in the past and everything. I really enjoy the villain in here and the different conflicts that he brings up and this is really a book about found family and some of the themes of like a collective society and, and it really just felt timely for a lot of the things we're going through right now as a society. There's also a really wonderful supportive female female romance in here that I just love. They are just so bonded and connected in like a really beautiful way and just a really good team so that was really awesome to see as well. So I ended up giving this 4.5 out of 5 stars. Not quite the 5 star that the first book was but this was also a cliffhanger ending so I'm looking forward to what the finale brings for this series. Then we have Take a Hint Danny Brown by Talia Hibbert. This is an adult contemporary romance and this is is actually in a series but you don't have to read them in any kind of order. These are all companion novels and follows the Brown sisters. So this is the companion to Get a Life Chloe Brown which I read earlier this year and this was an absolute delight. This does have trigger warnings for death of a parent and sibling as well as panic attacks but this is the romance between a bi, black, fat, witch who has a PhD and a Muslim rugby player who has panic attacks and he is a security guard and he ends up rescuing her sort of their friends and he ends up rescuing her during a drill because she doesn't leave the building and he carries her out of the building and someone takes a video of it so they become a trending hashtag and they decide to fake date because he has a nonprofit organization where he helps kids playing rugby and they're more connected to their feelings and they sort of have like therapy through rugby and sport and stuff so in an effort to kind of promote his nonprofit and that's like his younger niece's idea. He wants to continue using the hashtag so they get into this fake dating relationship. Does this have so many tropes in it that are wonderful? Absolutely it does. And this was just like so fun. I really like Talia Hibbert's books because she has this very fun rom-com style. I still don't love her sex scenes because they always take me out of the story. There's a little bit more raunchy and explicit than what I expect from a rom-com and what my personal comfort level is, although I feel like I enjoy these slightly more than the ones in Chloe Brown, but the it's laugh out loud 
loud, funny with some of the rom-com elements, and I just really like also that her books tend to not have a huge miscommunication factor. If there is a conflict with the characters, it lasts like a chapter, instead of a lot of books that are romance books where you know there's gonna be a happily ever after because that's what romance is, and you have to wait for all these chapters to get them to get to the point where they're like, fine, I hate that kind of, I don't like that stress. So this doesn't really have that. It has a lot of communication between people, and just like understanding, and, and fun, and flirtation, and all these great things. So I really love this. This personally had so many things that appealed to me. I mean, a bisexual witch? Yes. So I loved this and gave it 4.5 out of 5 stars. Took off 0.5 stars for the sex scenes because for me that doesn't quite work as well as I would like it to, but near perfection for me. I love these books and I'll continue to read this series and I think Tali Hibbert's going to be a must-read author for me. Then we have The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes by Suzanne Collins. This is the prequel to the Hunger Games trilogy. I feel like I've spent most of my month talking about this, even though I really haven't, but I've done a full reading vlog with spoilers in it about all of my thoughts about this, and this was our House Salt book club pick, so we have a whole live show talking about all of our thoughts about this. But basically, this was a book that I don't feel had to be written. Like, this was one of those books where I'm like, but why though? Why did we need the backstory of the child murdering oppressor who's a white man who has no remorse ever for what he does, doesn't go through a character arc at all. He's the same person at the beginning of this book than he is at the end, who really gives us no further knowledge that we really needed, because all the things that we find out that are little hints for the Hunger Games were, one, heavy-handed, she beats you over the head with them, and two, are all things that probably most of us could have figured out how we got to where we got. We didn't really need this. A lot of us agreed in the live show that it probably would have been more compelling and meaningful to actually have more of his rise to power and the place is that people could have maybe stopped him along the way for a for a, a book for our times you know instead of this thing where we just get to slowly because it's a pretty large book follow a character that doesn't have any kind of change at all to him not that he needed to change for the positive but he, he didn't even go from being like kind of okay to bad he just stayed the same the whole time and had a love story in it that it didn't need to have and it was really really gross with like the oppressor and oppressor and was just everything that none of us really felt that we needed. So this was um awful and I gave it 1.5 out of 5 stars. The 0.5 were for like some of the Hunger Games references I guess but <laughs> it's still I don't even want to give it 0.5. I almost want to say it's one star because even those were, were not great. We're not good. So the 0.5 is for nostalgia I guess. Um yeah this 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 didn't need to be written, and I'm sad that I own it. I then read Kiss Me Every Day by Denna Blake. This is a arc that I got from NetGalley, and this is a female-female lesbian romance because both these characters do identify as lesbians. And this is an adult contemporary romance, and this is kind of a second chance romance. These characters met about a year ago, and they had this really explosive kiss, and then things happened where the one girl actually went home with the other main character's sister, and they got married, and they are not actually a good fit in present day. So a lot of things are happening, their relationship is falling apart, all this stuff. So the main character, Wynn, who is the other sister that didn't get with this girl, she ends up having like a Groundhog Day situation in which she has to relive that day until she fixes sort of everything. And I actually enjoyed like the first 50 to 60 percent of this book. It did take a little bit longer than I really like for Wynn to figure out that she was reliving her days. Like she has a dog and the dog appears as a puppy obviously like back when she's reliving the time and she's like haha what a funny joke and it's like uh, uh, what? And her house is being renovated when it's already been fixed in present day and she's like how did this happen? And I'm like aren't you what? And it took her like a couple days to get that so that was a little bit frustrating but generally speaking I was liking like some of the changes she was making to her life because not only is it the romantic stuff but she's also fixing some things about her work life, about her interactions with like neighbors and friends and all this stuff. Then about 60% of the way through some things change where she makes some choices about involving other people who don't know they're reliving their days but she like tells them and that all seems very unrealistic and there was also some moments that in the final product day I didn't really like as much as things she did earlier in the reliving days because she relives the day over and over and over again. So yeah the ending I just I didn't didn't love it as much. So it really took it downhill for me because a lot of it was just really unbelievable almost and just a little bit like contrived feeling when the beginning of it was so good. So I ended up giving this two out of five stars. I then read Abaddon's Gate by James S.A. Corey. This is the third book in the Expanse series, which is a adult science fiction space opera series. I've done a review for the first, I think two books, but at least the first book, so I'll link that on the screen. I enjoyed this book, but this is always a multiple perspective story. So one character is one that we follow every single time, James Holden, who is the captain of one of the ships that ends up being a very major player in a lot of the political stuff that's happening. There's a lot of political stuff happening with the solar system, 
because this is within our solar system, and then there's some intergalactic, I guess you could say, things that are happening, universe-level stuff, because there is an alien virus that was sent into our solar system and is basically turning people and things into gross space zombies. So that's an also a factor. So I sometimes describe this as like a Game of Thrones feeling in space because you have the political and then like this creepy paranormal stuff going on. So this book definitely felt slower because I really enjoyed seeing Holden again because I've, he's grown on me over the books. But the other perspectives I just didn't care for as much in this book. And this book definitely felt slower. It felt like a break in a lot of the action and the things we were doing just felt like it was taking a breath before things that will happen later on with a lot of that like paranormal stuff. And it was much more of a focused political view than a more wider range that we got in the previous book. So I really liked the second book and I didn't like this one quite as much because it felt slower and wasn't as easy to read as the previous books have been. So I ended up giving this three out of five stars. I still really love this series. I'm going to continue it and I think the books are going to get better, but this one was just kind of a lag for me. Then we have The Raven Tower by Anne Leckie. This is a standalone fantasy story that follows a trans man and he is the aide to a heir to the throne who's not really an heir to the throne because it's more of a religious symbol, but he is his aide and he is sort of like a fish out of water following what's going on politically in this area that has a lot to do with various kinds of gods, the way the gods affect this political structure and just some like scheming backstabbing mystery elements. I do have a full review for this which will be going up on Monday so check that out because this is much more of a thematic story. This is definitely a story that keeps you at arm's length from the characters in my opinion. This is actually told in second person point of view which I know is very hard and took me a bit to get into but eventually end up working for me because it is actually being narrated by a god in this world and you get their story and their past and how it's affecting the present time as well as them watching our main character. So our main characters and the characters that they interact with aren't necessarily, they don't feel like as close because you're sort of watching them from a distance with this god character. But I really liked all of the discussion of the gods and the history of the world and how people will ascribe certain things to gods even if the gods didn't do them. I thought that was very fascinating. And just like how people empower these gods and where they come from and all this talk of like god and religion. You know how I feel about religious stuff in fantasy books. I really like it. So this kind of pantheon of gods and their interactions was the most fascinating part of this book with the plot stuff around our main character being less interesting. I will say that I did really appreciate that since our character was a trans man, the narrative didn't really bring that up much. The people that found out that he was trans didn't make it a big deal at all. It's not a tragic story or an oppressive story or where his transness is made to be a big issue. He's a trans man that's allowed to live his life and is really respected in the culture as well. So that was really cool to see. But ultimately the end of this also felt a little bit rushed and I felt like it wasn't really the end of a standalone. It felt like I could have maybe learned more. So I ended up giving this three out of five stars. And lastly, I read The Bromance Book Club by Lissa K. Adams. This is an adult contemporary romance and it actually follows two characters who are already married and they are on the brink of divorce. And our male main character Gavin. He is a baseball player. He is devastated about his wife potentially leaving him and so he is brought into this book club with a lot of his friends who are also like either baseball players or sports people or whatever and they are all the group of straight men who read romance novels in order to learn to be more in touch with their emotions, with their sexuality, with their wife's needs, how to talk to women, all these things. I kind of call them like manuals but not in like a skeezy way. And so he's brought into that to try to win his wife back. And Thea is his wife. We also get to follow her perspective and she is really struggling because of a lot of her past with her parents relationship and the trauma that that caused her. So we get to follow Gavin and Thea as they try to fix their relationship. Gavin more than her because he's the one that's really trying to make this work. So it's a second chance romance where they sort of like fake date because he sort of sets up an agreement that like they have to you know go on dates together and do some of these things and it is wonderful. I gave it 4.5 out of 5 stars but I might bump it up to 5. I really liked seeing these two characters who really do still feel for each other try to make it work and just the things that were keeping them apart were all very understandable for the situation but neither character really felt like an asshole and even though Gavin like messes up a lot he sort of like 
not to add in the himbo discourse, but he's sort of a himbo where like he's kind of dumb, but like he tries so hard and he's not trying to be like a douche. And like the things that he does are not necessarily like asshole behaviors. He's just like, he wasn't in touch with his emotions, but he's like really trying and he goes through a really good arc. And then he also calls Thea out on some of the things that she's bringing to the table. So you see these two people growing in order to grow back together. And I really enjoyed that. The things I didn't enjoy so much was that Thea does have a sister who is like overly against their relationship and is just like this over the top sort of like sort of villain but you don't really have like villains in romance books but like this sort of antagonistic character and then these characters are supposed to be like early to mid 20s and they definitely feel like 32. Uh, they also have young children so they just felt like I know there's plenty of couples that are young like this but they just felt older and like they'd been in the relationship a little bit longer so there was a bit of disconnect there with me, but I really enjoyed this. And I will continue to read these books because I really like that it's like this group of guys who are confronting their own toxic masculinity and fixing themselves and the women aren't putting energy into that. They're doing it themselves like that. That is so satisfying. So I will continue to read the books in this series. I actually have an arc of the third book from NetGalley already, but I want to read the second book first, which does follow Thea's sister who hopefully I start to pull for in that book. But yeah, I really liked this and I found a new romance series to get into. So that is it for all the books that I read in June. So comment down below and let me know how you felt about some of these books if you read them and also what your favorite book that you read this month was. So thank you all for watching and I'll see all of you guys soon. Bye.